It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first uh, visit to Kaust, and certainly the, the facilities here look uh, pretty spectacular. Um, I was in my room last night uh, working on this talk and furiously uh, throwing out slides. Uh, so what I want to talk about today are, uh, I want to put up a slide uh, similar to the slide that, slides that uh, Wolfgang Meyer and Marcus Aldane put up on challenges for high pressure combustion. Uh, I, I was going to talk about um, uh, the work we're doing also in addition to aviation gas turbine combustion with stationary gas turbine combustion test rigs, but I won't have time to talk about that. Uh, we're doing five and now ten, we're moving to 10 kilohertz PIV and OHPLF simultaneously, and we do this as a, I, I won't say a routine measurement in our high pressure test rigs, but this is the, the, these are the techniques that we use on a fairly regular basis, although it takes a long time to align and get them ready to go for a high pressure test rig. I'll talk about chirp probe pulse femtosecond cars measurements that we're doing in turbulent atmospheric pressure flames at the, at the moment and that we would uh, want to apply eventually in high pressure. And I'll talk about future directions for high pressure diagnostics and for our program at, at Purdue. Uh, uh, challenges for high pressure measurements. Uh, one of the big ones is design of the optical access and uh, ensuring that the windows survive. Uh, we want to try to get as much optical access as we can to parts of the flow field that we're interested in. Uh, signal to noise is a challenge, and dynamic range for the measurements is also a challenge. Uh, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that, especially in terms of the PIV measurements we're making. Uh, we have to do everything remotely. We're, we uh, have lost one window. Uh, when we were first uh, running our aviation gas turbine rig, and we're kind of still picking up glass from that uh, three years later. Uh, it went all over the test cell, so we, we can't be out there when the, when the test rig is operating, so everything has to be uh, very well aligned, and, and we also move our, our systems around, and so we have to be very, very careful when we're setting up the system that we run all of our optical beams at right angles when they hit a mirror, for example. Cost of running the test rigs is, is very significant. We run uh, liquid fuel. We actually run uh, FT fuel on our test rig. And uh, so that, that you know, costs about $10 a gallon. And so on a, a long test day, we can run uh, into thousands, running thousands of dollars worth of, of fuel. Uh, and so we want to be able to collect data as fast as we possibly can. Uh, now, one thing about we're, we're using so-called high-speed data uh, uh, laser techniques. One thing that's not high-speed is when you have to wait for the computer, uh, the uh, camera to download uh, data to the computer. Uh, but that that problem is going to uh, get less and less of a problem as we go on. I think as cameras get uh, better, laser beam absorption and signal trapping are things we have to worry about. And then laser beam steering and signal defocusing due to thermal gradients are also things that we worry about a lot. So here's our aviation gas turbine uh, combustion test rig. It's a uh, water-cooled, uh, four-sided optical access, and uh, it's a 106 millimeter by 106 millimeter uh, channel into which we put our uh, advanced mixer injector to take a look at it. Now, with this rig, we have gone up to conditions of over 20 bar. Our inlet air temperature is uh, uh, our, uh, the maximum temperature we get to is about 760K with our current air heater. We're getting a new one I'll talk about later. And we have gone up to 1.5 megawatts of thermal power with this, with this system. Uh, and we have uh, now, now almost two, uh, 200 hours of hot fire test time, and we've only had one window damage incident, and that was uh, when we were, uh, during our first run. And so, there we go. So this is the, uh, the system in operation. Uh, there's laser ignition. We use laser ignition that, that lets us operate or ignite at much milder conditions than when we were first running it, when we would have a spark plug in one of these walls. And this is an advanced mixer injector we're looking at. Uh, this is a, a pilot-only condition. Uh, and so you can see the, the excellent optical access that we, we have here uh, for the system. The, uh, the way that we get the windows to survive is we, 
we have a, at our uh, lab a large supply of liquid nitrogen. We also do a lot of rocket work, not me personally, but uh, Professor Anderson's and Professors Anderson and Heaster. And so uh, in, the, in the window design, we have a, a, a cavity, a pressurized, uh, well, we, we pressurize the cavity. We use a two window design where we have an inner window to contain the flame and an outer window to contain the pressure. And then we have a film cooling manifold where we flow heated nitrogen over our windows. Uh, so we've, we heat the uh, nitrogen so to minimize the thermal stresses between the beginning of the window and the end of the window. And uh, th we also uh, are able to control the fuel flow rate or the film flow rate much better because we can pressurize this to much higher pressures than our inlet air. And so this really helps our, uh, we haven't had problems with window breakage since then, even though we, we know at times that our, the flame is directly onto the window. Uh, so we've been uh, quite pleased with that. Here's just a little bit of a, a blow up of, the, uh, of the, the pressurized cavity between the inner window and the outer window, and then the film cooling manifold. So we have an array of holes in the, in the, uh, in the dome plate here uh, that allow the film cooling to uh, uh, be right on the window. So here's the system in operation. This is a test rig with uh, the PIB system in operation. Uh, the pictures don't look nearly as good when we do OHPLF because we can't see the beam. Uh, but it's really spectacular when the, when the uh, system is going and uh, the flame is, uh, the flames really aren't as bright as you would think. And, uh, and uh, the laser is going and we, uh, are doing the OHPLF and the, the PIV. So here's the system for the OHPLF and the PIV. We have an edge wave system uh, for the PIV, which gives us about three millijoules of pulse at the 10 kilohertz rep rate, six millijoules per pulse at five kilohertz. And uh, then we have another system where we have a 90 watt edge wave system that pumps a credo dilaser, and we get about 0 0.7 millijoules out of this at 10 kilohertz. Uh, so uh, we get seven watts of ultraviolet going into the, uh, well, at the exit to the laser, and then about five to six watts going into the, uh, la uh, the uh, test section. Now we have to, there are, are other optics in here that are not really shown. We have to pay a lot of attention to beam quality because our lasers are not actually right by the, uh, the, the, the test uh, rig, but they're in the laser lab, and so the, we have a propagation uh, distance of about 10 meters that we have to go to get to the test rig. And so strange things can happen to the laser beams on the way to the test rig if you're not careful. So this is the, the injector we're looking at and we're interested in the near nozzle region and, and a lot of our work, although we're now trying to move down, downstream and, and look at the recirculation bubble. Here's the PIV window and then the PLIF window uh, goes uh, across. Uh, so here are, are some uh, PIV images. Well, th this is a PIV image for a non-reacting flow where we don't have liquid jet injection. And then here's an image without PIV system. This is, these are the liquid jets. Now, most of the time, we're, this is, was a run at a fairly low inlet air temperature. So most of the time, we don't have nearly this much uh, liquid fuel present in our images. And then here's a combined image where we have the PIV seed and uh, the liquid fuel. And so we have to figure out ways to filter out the, the liquid fuel uh, droplets from our PIV image. Now here uh, is uh, 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 10 bar, uh, 550 kilowatt uh, thermal power image. And uh, so this is, this is a pretty good image of, uh, this is still early in our, in our development of the PIV, but you can see the liquid fuel jet coming out here uh, from the main. And, we have PIV particles here in the non-reacting flow, and then we, we have uh, PIV images, or PIV particles here in the reacting part of the flow. Now when we go up to uh, 18 bars here and 950 kilowatts, uh, it's not really the pressure that's a, a problem here. Uh, you can see outside in this non-reacting part of the flow, uh, the particles are still uh, in pretty good focus. Here, uh, the particles are uh, are blurred by the thermal gradients. And so these are things that we're, we're continuing to work on. I'll talk a little bit more about how we're addressing that. Now, another thing we've run into uh, as we, as, uh, you know, this was uh, actually the first time I'd uh, really done PIV. And so not having done PIV, I always believed PIV images. 
uh, uh, and uh, so we, I sent one, a graduate student over to deal our Stuttgart Carson Slabaugh to work with Wolfgang Meyer and Isaac Box, and, and uh, so we learned how to do PIV at high pressure there, uh, which was very valuable for our, our uh, efforts. And so here are some more recent PIV images where, okay, so this is a, a PIV image uh, taken from a reacting flow, and uh, here uh, we're uh, concentrating on getting good velocity measurements in the jet that's coming out of the, the, uh, the main here. And so we had a, a short uh, pulse, duration, uh, pulse separation of maybe a couple microseconds between the PIV sheets there. Now this, this flow field also has a recirculation region right here. To do measurements, good measurements in there, then uh, we wa would want to have a pulse separation of maybe 10 microseconds. Uh, so here's a P here are PIV images from, uh, with a 10 microsecond uh, separation. So we're acquiring these images. Uh, these were acquired at 5 kilohertz. We've now moved to 10 kilohertz uh, with our, our PIV imaging. And so we've also greatly expanded the, the region over which we're collecting the images. And, uh, uh, and uh, the other thing uh, that I'd uh, like to point out is um, we're, we're figuring out ways to uh, sort of combine the two images. So in this image, uh, we're not getting very good um, velocity measurements in, the, in the, uh, the main here because the pulse separation is too large and we lose correlation between the uh, images. And so we're working with Pavlos Vakos at our, our, our uh, he's on our faculty, and he's well known for uh, developing uh, image uh, algorithms, PIV image algorithms to deal with some of these issues with dynamic range. Uh, so here's our five kilohertz OHPLF system for, for high power, high pressure flames. Uh, we have an edge wave that puts out 90 watts at 532 nanometers, and we pump a credo and we get seven watts at 283 nanometers. Uh, here are some of our images. This is an image at a fairly low pressure of uh, a little under six bar. Uh, we have the laser sheet propagating from top to bottom. And for the particular conditions we look at in this, in this, for these flames, we don't see significant self-absorption, which was quite, quite a surprise. Here are images, at, an image sequence at uh, 10, uh, a little over 10 bars. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, with an inlet air temperature of 700 K and an equivalence ratio, overall equivalence ratio of 0.5. And in particular here, we're looking at an event where we have some burning of, of fuel that's going back and impinging on uh, the heat shield. And so that's, uh, with these uh, measurements then, what we really use the OHPLF for is to track the flame fronts. And then with the combined PIV, we can we can map the interaction of the velocity field with the flame fronts. And uh, so that's, that's what we do with the combined uh, PLF, PIV system. Uh, so here's just some of the uh, equipment. We have a very small laser laboratory at the moment, about 150 square feet. Here are the laser systems in, operate, uh, in uh, place around the test rig. Uh, we use a lot of, this, uh, uh, of these uh, Linus structures. Uh, we picked that up from DLR Stuttgart. Carson Slabaugh came back and started ordering a lot of very expensive equipment uh, like you'd seen in the DLR Stuttgart lab. And uh, so we have, uh, in this case, we have a PIV camera here and an OHPLIF camera here. Uh, and uh, with the two-sided optical access, there's another picture of the rig in operation. And then, so we can get the combined PIV, PLIF, uh, images and, and so far we've been look, trying to look at structures very near uh, the exit of the nozzle. Here is the OH uh, PLF image process to give us surface uh, flame density. Uh, and then here is an average PIV image and we're uh, in particular in interested in the recirculation zones uh, near, this, uh, near this nozzle. So we've developed the test rig uh, and uh, 
and the uh, laser uh, optical systems and developed experience in, in operating these remotely. Uh, we've performed high-speed planar measurements at pressures up to 250 PSI. Uh, and uh, then we've done a lot of work to develop analysis tools to extract quantitative information from the measurement. Now recently we've been doing a lot of PIV measurements. Uh, uh, Wolfgang uh, yesterday talked about some PIV measurements that were done by, uh, stereo PIV measurements that were done by Isaac Box and Carson <coughs> Slabois and, and others at, uh, in a visit that Carson made to DLR Stuttgart. And we've now started to do those same sorts of PIV measurements in our, our liquid-fueled high-pressure test rig. And uh, so that we are actually using three cameras so that we can uh, get uh, 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 a better uh, calibration uh, for our PIV measurements. And, and then the stereo PIV also allows us to get the uh, third component of velocity, which is critical in these highly swirled uh, 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 flow fields, and so we, I don't have any processed results from this uh, as of yet. Uh, we just took this data a month ago or so, and so take, uh, we're still cranking through all the, all the uh, data that we took. We did uh, a number of flame conditions and took a lot of data for each of those flame conditions, and uh, so here are just stereoscop uh, uh, fl uh, framed from the stereo camera one, stereo camera two, and the reference. Now, the other thing we've done recently, we have this problem with dynamic range. Uh, when we use uh, um, uh, pulse separation of two microseconds, we're very good at getting the high velocities, but we have these recirculation regions with very low velocities, so we get low accuracy there. And uh, so we'd rather have a pulse separation of 10 microseconds. And so recently, we've taken some data and these are just some images that the graduate students sent me uh, the night that they were setting up to take the data. And uh, so they, this, this is our test cell and we have a, we have a uh, courtyard that has a cement wall that they shoot the laser at uh, and, uh, in order to get all the three laser beams aligned. So we use three laser beams uh, here with separations of two and ten microseconds so we can get the low and high velocities at the same time. Now we're also right by an airport. so. I saw these pictures uh, um, the next morning, and I was glad the FBI hadn't been to see us to, uh, to ask us why we were shooting laser beams at flames. So I want to talk now about uh, femtosecond cars. Uh, here's a, a diagram for nanosecond cars, which we've done for, uh, or many people in this room have done for almost 30 years. Uh, so in this case, we have a, a single mode, or a green <coughs> pump beam, a broadband lie laser to give us our, our Stokes beam, and then another laser beam, which uh, most of the time now is at a different color. This is so-called dual pump cars. Uh, and in, in the cars measurement then, the signal comes out as a laser beam. And so we can get the temperature then by looking at the spectrum of the, uh, of the uh, cars uh, signal. Now, uh, I started to get interested in femtosecond cars in the early 2000s after listening to a uh, a talk by Marcus Motzkus at the um, Gordon conference, and at first I wasn't listening very uh, closely because I figured femtosecond lasers were pretty useless for gas phase diagnostics. And then I, about halfway through the talk, I realized that Raman transitions are two photon transitions, and so I started to listen more closely. So uh, for application as a diagnostic, we have to have high enough signal levels that we can make uh, measurements in a probe volume with a maximum dimension of, 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 say, a millimeter is what we would want. So how effectively can Raman transitions be excited with a 200 wave number bandwidth when the, with the transitions are only 0.1 wave numbers? And it turns out they can be excited extremely effectively uh, because it's a two-photon transition. The other thing we have to answer is how do we actually extract temperature uh, from the single-shot femtosecond cars um, uh, uh, spectra. And so uh, it, what happens when, when you have a pump beam and a Stokes beam, femtosecond, uh, say 60 femtosecond beams overlapped, uh, there are multiple frequency pairs under those spectral envelopes that give us a, essentially a giant Raman coherence at t equals zero. And at t equals zero, it, you also excite all of the Raman transitions with the same efficiency because usually your Raman band is, has a, a small spectral width compared to the spectral width of the lasers. 
Uh, so at time t equals zero, you get a giant Raman coherence in the medium. Now, as time goes along, that Raman coherence will decay, not because of collisions, uh, not at these time scales at least, at atmospheric pressure, we still haven't had any collisions, but because all the transitions that you excite oscillate at a slightly different frequency. So at, at low temperature, those frequencies are very tightly grouped. The band is, is very narrow, and so you get slow decay of your signal. And then at higher temperatures, you get a much faster decay because you have a greater frequency spread of, of oscillators. Uh, at high temperature, you multiple vibrational bands, for example. And so you can hear, see here beating uh, as these bands oscillate at their different frequencies. And the decay is because uh, the, the rotational transitions are oscillating at different frequencies. So temperature can be directly mapped to the, the decay of this initial giant Raman coherence. And uh, so the question is, how can, you, how can you measure that on a single laser shot? And Marcus Motzkus also uh, provided the, the answer to that in, uh, in by chirping the probe beam. And, uh, and by chirping the probe beam, here we have a Stokes beam at 800 nanometers, a pump beam at 674 nanometers. These are overlapped at t equals zero. And uh, so you get this giant Raman coherence. And then you chirp the probe beam then to probe that. And the, you send it through a long rod. And the red beams come out, the red frequencies come out first because the refractive index is lower uh, for the red beams. And the blue beams come out last. And so then you send that in. in and the red beam interacts with the, the, the uh, initial part of the coherence here. And the blue uh, part of the beam interacts with the um, later part of the coherence. It's not really that simple, uh, uh, but luckily, and, and luckily uh, the computer knew that. And so what the signals actually look like are, are what looks at first like a Raman signal with rotational transitions. This is actually caused by the beating between the non-resonant part of the signal and the resonant part of the signal. But we can model that very effectively. And the nice thing about uh, femtosecond lasers is, is when you look at the, the signal on the camera, you get just a little bit of, of modulation up and down. You can almost overlay the raw spectra for 1,000 thousand, thousand laser shots, and it, it would look pretty much like this spectrum. And so we get, in this case, this is, this is uh, one of, the, as Bob Dibble sa uh, said, this is typical data. This is the best we've ever done uh, with a standard deviation of about a half a percent there. Uh, and so we, we took this measurement technique we've been developing for years, and uh, so the interaction with, with DLR Stuttgart started when they wanted to, uh, Isaac Box was asking about femtosecond cars. We wanted to learn how to do PIV at high pressure. And so we've, we've done measurements in the DLR swirl burner. Wolfgang and Isaac Box came over for a visit uh, in the fall of 2013. Here's the burner in operation. And, uh, and we took measurements at 73 locations in in, for two different flames, one of which had a uh, low level of thermoacoustic instabilities and one of which had a high level of thermoacoustic instabilities. And the amazing thing was we saw signal on every laser shot. Uh, there, there really wasn't a laser shot where we didn't see signal. So we get essentially 100%, uh, uh, nearly 100% of the laser shots, we get a, a meaningful temperature out. Now, that wasn't quite true because we had a problem that we didn't see until after, after we'd done the data analysis where we had some scattered light getting into the, the detector at some of our, our heights. But the big problem we had, uh, we're, we're, still, we're still writing this up. We're about, we had a symposium paper and we're about to uh, send in another couple papers to combustion in a flame. Uh, and we've made a lot of, uh, we've gotten a lot of insight into the, the, the thermoacoustic structure of these flames, I think, from the femtosecond cars measurement. But one thing we ran into was the dynamic range of the measurements. Uh, the, the signal is a thousand times weaker at a temperature of 2,000 Kelvin as compared to room temperature. And so uh, later, after we'd completed, and, and so we, we had a lot of, of uh, laser shots at 300 Kelvin where uh, we had saturated the, the cameras. We're using electron multiplying CCDs. And so in the very high temperature region of the, of the flow, we turned up the gain in order to get better signal to noise. And so uh, we borrowed a later that, uh, uh, in the summer of 2014, we borrowed a camera and a spectrometer from Andor. 
and we set up a system where we have a 90% channel here, a beam splitter that uh, transmits 90%, reflects 10%, and so now we have a two-channel system. And so when we do have those low temperature spectra there, you can see in the 90% in the channel, uh, the, the, the peaks here are clipped off. Uh, the camera is completely saturated and we can't get a very good fit. Uh, but in our 10% channel camera, uh, we get a very good fit. And so we get a, uh, what we think is a meaningful temperature for the low temperature gas. And, and then the inverse is, is true. At high temperature then, uh, we don't get enough signal and noise in our 10% channel in order to make the measurement. But with a 90% channel, we get uh, uh, very good uh, agreement. So, uh, so we, get, we were very pleased with these measurements. Uh, we did have, uh, we're comparing them with, uh, with Raman scattering measurements that were taken at DLR. And we get good comparison, especially for the flame with high thermoacoustic instabilities. Um, and uh, the spatial resolution of the measurement is 500 microns. It's of at least a factor better to, uh, of two better than for nanosecond cars. And that's because we're actually dealing with laser beams instead of neodymium YAG beams. So uh, the, the ultra-fast laser system, the spatial beam quality is very good. And so we get very good focusing. So also, the fitting procedure is, is at least an order of magnitude faster than for nanosecond cars. Uh, and so we took uh, at least 2,000 laser shots at each of those 73 points. And so we've got all the data analyzed now. And so we're writing it up. So, so in the future, we'd like to take this out to our gas turbine test rigs and make temperature measurements in uh, the flow fields at high pressure. Uh, the big obstacle right now is that with the laser lab we have at the moment, the ultra-fast laser system would never be able to operate it, just the temperature and uh, humidity fluctuations would be too, uh, too high. Uh, beam steering may be an issue in, at high pressure. Uh, and Alexis <laughs> Bolin and, and Chris Cleaver at, at uh, Sandia National Lab have demonstrated a, a two-beam technique where they can get line imaging or even uh, planar imaging. Uh, they, they do have the advantage they have this huge uh, picosecond laser that puts out a lot of energy, but it operates at 20 hertz. We'd like to be able to do that line imaging up at 5 kilohertz, and so we're, we're <coughs> working on, on ways to do that. Uh, but one of the nice things about femtosecond cars is the signal is proportional to uh, pressure squared. So uh, we, um, uh, so we, we, we have high hopes for femtosecond cars and high pressure systems. Uh, we've uh, got a, a DPSS laser now that goes actually up to 40 kilohertz when it was delivered, and we've ordered a pulse burst laser system uh, for use in the high pressure facility, uh, which Marcus just talked about and Jeff Sutton will talk about. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is we have done all of our measurements so far. We have one 500 square foot test cell with four or five test rigs in it, depending on how many programs are active, and we just got fully funded to develop a new uh, facility where we have five uh, 500 squid, uh, square foot test cells and a 2,000 square foot laser lab, that's what I really wanted, uh, right next to those test cells with good temperature and humidity control so we can do things like femtosecond cars. Uh, the other thing, as part of this project, the first part of the project, we got a, <coughs> a new air heater uh, which will allow us to go to temperatures of 1100 K, 1500 Fahrenheit, uh, pressures almost up to 60 bars, and uh, 4 kilograms per second inlet air. And so especially the, uh, the this is uh, uh, some of our industrial sponsors were very, very interested in, in getting, uh, us <coughs> having this capability. So here I'll put up uh, some uh, acknowledgments for the various graduate students and some of the professors that I've worked with on the high pressure measurements. Uh, and uh, also Isaac Box and Wolfgang Meyer, I'd like to thank them again for uh, uh, their collaborations on the high pressure PIB PLIF. And the femtosecond cars measurements here are the graduate students that have worked on that. And then uh, Isaac Box and Wolfgang Meyer came over uh, after the symposium uh, in 2014 uh, to do the, uh, oh no, no, actually that was the summer before. It was after the Gordon conference, I think you came over. Okay, with that, uh, I'd uh, like to take any questions you might have if there's time. Okay, we'll just have to <laughs> Thank you, Bob. We have time for one short question. One short question. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, 
you showed the blurring um, in the in the combustor with the PIV images, and you said you're dealing with it. And I just wondered, what are you doing for that? Well, we're uh, we're working with Pavlos on that, and uh, that's one of the reasons we're trying to go to multi-camera, you know, almost tomographic system to try to get better idea of where the particles actually are. It becomes a problem at 20 atmospheres. Is that what you said? Well. Uh, no, that's, that's not, uh, it becomes a problem with high thermal powers right. mm -hmm. uh, and high pressure. So uh, if you look at that image, when we don't have any, any flame, there's no problem with the, with the uh, particle blurring. But so there, there will be parts of the flow field where it will be a problem, <coughs> parts of the flow field where it will, will not be a problem. Thank you. Let's move on to the next speaker.